In June 1948, Frank LaSalle, a convicted child rapist, perpetrated the kidnapping of 11-year-old Florence Sally Horner. During the harrowing period of her disappearance, Sally's family resigned themselves to the grim belief that they might never be reunited with her. However, a startling telephone call nearly two years later shattered their expectations, briefly reuniting the family with Sally. Unfortunately, this joyous moment was short-lived, as tragedy would once again darken their lives in 1952, born on April 16, 1937, in Trenton to Russell and Ella, Goff, Horner, Florence Sally Horner, came into the world with an older half-sister, Susan Swain, born in 1926. Unfortunately, the family faced a significant loss when Russell Horner passed away on March 24, 1943, at the age of 41, leaving Ella Horner to navigate the challenges of single motherhood. Seeking support and companionship, Sally's sister Susan took a pivotal step in her life when she married Alvin Charles Panaro two years after Russell's death. The family established their home at 944 Linden Saint, where Sally attended Northeast Elementary School, engaging in the routine experiences of childhood. As Sally approached the milestone of her 11th birthday, she harbored a desire to join a girls' club at school, a seemingly innocent wish that took a dark turn. The existing club members, however, imposed an unusual and troubling initiation requirement. Sally was instructed to steal an item from the local five-and-dime store to gain entry into their group. In the early months of 1948, the pressure led Sally to commit an act of theft. Whether it was March or June of that year remains uncertain due to conflicting reports in old newspaper articles. Sally chose a notebook from the five-cent counter at the local Woolworths, unwittingly setting the stage for a fateful encounter. It was during this theft that a man named Frank LaSalle discovered Sally in the act marking the beginning of a tragic and unsettling chapter in her short life. I am an FBI agent. You're under arrest, he said. In truth, LaSalle was a 50-year-old individual with a prior conviction for child rape. He had recently been granted parole after completing a sentence for the statutory rape of five girls, ranging in ages from 12 to 14, as reported by Shelby Vitek in New Jersey Monthly. This release marked a concerning development, allowing LaSalle to re-enter society despite his disturbing criminal history, particularly involving underage victims. LaSalle had a history of legal troubles, including charges of assault and battery, bigamy, enticing a minor, and violating the Mann Act. Upon discovering Sally's transgression, she became visibly distressed, prompting LaSalle to exploit the situation. He deceitfully informed her that the city hall was located just across the street and threatened to send her to reform school. However, he cunningly offered a reprieve, promising to spare her from such consequences if she agreed to occasionally report back to him. This unsettling interaction marked the beginning of a disturbing pattern in LaSalle's behavior. In June 1948, he once again approached Sally deepening the ominous circumstances surrounding their connection. He said he would have to take me to Atlantic City because the government insisted I go there. He said it wouldn't take long to straighten things out. He telephoned my mother and said he was taking some other girls to Atlantic City and would have to take me. Reported to Sheriff Howard Hornbuckle of Santa Clara County by Sally Horner shortly after her rescue, as documented in the Courier Post on March 22, 1950. On June 14, 1948, accompanied by Sally's mother, Ella Horner, Sally embarked on a bus journey from Camden with LaSalle. Ella Horner was acquainted with LaSalle under the alias Frank Warner. Despite Horner's efforts to locate the two girls at the bus station, she only encountered Warner and did not see her daughter or the other girl. Nevertheless, Ella Horner allowed Sally to board the bus in the company of LaSalle. This decision made with the mistaken belief in LaSalle's trustworthiness, set in motion a sequence of events that would have profound and tragic consequences for Sally Horner. Sally told Hornbuckle, I went away with him and a woman about 25 years old. He called her Miss Robinson and said she was his secretary and he paid her $90 a week. Instead of Atlantic City, we went to Baltimore. Miss Robinson disappeared and I never saw her again. That evening, Sally reached out to her mother, providing reassurance about her well-being. 
The subsequent day, Ella Horner received a letter from Sally, stating that she was residing at 200 Pacific Avenue in Atlantic City. In the ensuing weeks, mother and daughter maintained their connection through a series of letters and phone calls. However, the tone took a distressing turn when Horner received a letter from Sally indicating plans to travel to Baltimore with the man. A subsequent and final letter arrived, announcing Sally's decision to cease correspondence. Unbeknownst to Horner, this marked a grim turning point in Sally's life. Upon their arrival in Baltimore, LaSalle subjected Sally to sexual assault and continued to perpetrate such acts repeatedly. He wielded a firearm, using it as a means to control and intimidate Sally, threatening imprisonment if she attempted to escape or return home. This disturbing chain of events underscored the harrowing circumstances Sally found herself trapped in during this period. As per news articles from 1950, LaSalle and Sally resided in Baltimore for a duration of eight months, during which Sally attended a parochial school. Ella Horner reported her daughter missing to the Camden police on August 3, 1948, when all communication with Sally abruptly ceased. Despite authorities' attempts to locate them in Baltimore, LaSalle and Sally were not found at their residence, as relayed by LaSalle's landlady. Upon learning that the police were searching for him through this intermediary, LaSalle took decisive action and fled to Dallas, Texas, with Sally in tow. This relocation marked the beginning of an extended period, spanning over a year, during which they remained in Dallas, evading the authorities. Then in mid to late March 1950, Sally was attending a Dallas school when she confided in a school chum about intimate relations between her and her father. The classmate told her, what I was doing with him was wrong, and I ought to stop, Sally later said. Following this incident, LaSalle relocated her to San Jose, California, taking up residence in a trailer at a tourist camp. Throughout the entire period spent with LaSalle, he maintained an unwavering presence, ceaselessly overseeing every aspect of her life. Regrettably, she found herself devoid of any solitary moments, leaving her without the opportunity to break away and seek the help she desperately needed. The continuous vigilance imposed by LaSalle intensified the oppressive circumstances of her situation, trapping her in a distressing and isolating environment. Despite this, just three days into their stay in San Jose, LaSalle departed, leaving Sally unattended at the trailer for the first time as he went to purchase food. Seizing the opportunity, Sally promptly sought assistance from a female resident at the camp to use the telephone. She urgently dialed her mother, Ella Horner. Tragically, the telephone company had disconnected Horner's phone due to her recent job loss as a seamstress. Undeterred, Sally then called her sister, Susan Panaro. Alvin Panaro, Susan's husband, answered the call, and Sally, overwhelmed with emotion, tearfully implored, send the FBI after me, please. In that desperate moment, Sally's cry for help underscored the urgency and gravity of her situation. Panaro, filled with overwhelming excitement, fervently urged Sally to disclose her precise location, a request she willingly fulfilled. Passing the phone to his wife, Alvin facilitated the first conversation between the sisters in a span of 21 months. This reunion marked a poignant moment, encapsulating the emotional intensity of their long-awaited connection after such an extended period of separation. Tell mother I'm okay and don't worry. I want to come home. I've been afraid to call before, Sally cried. Susan Panero instructed her younger sister to remain at the camp until the police arrived, emphasizing the importance of her safety. Without hesitation, Panaro and Susan contacted the Camden detectives who were actively working on Sally's abduction case. In turn, the Camden detectives swiftly communicated with both the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office and the FBI office in San Jose, relaying critical information about Sally's situation and advising caution in approaching Frank LaSalle. In response to the urgent call, three deputies from Clara County promptly arrived at the camp, executing a swift and successful rescue operation that freed Sally from her distressing circumstances. At 1 p.m. Pacific time, deputies and FBI agents discreetly positioned themselves, strategically awaiting LaSalle's exit from a city bus as he approached the trailer where he and Sally were residing. With careful precision, law enforcement surrounded him, and he surrendered without resistance. This strategic and well-coordinated effort 
led to the apprehension of LaSalle and the safe rescue of Sally from the clutches of her captor. Upon learning of the situation, Camden County Prosecutor Mitchell Cohen, accompanied by two detectives, swiftly boarded a flight to California to address the unfolding circumstances. Approximately at 11.30 p.m. on March 31, 1950, Cohen, Sally, and the two detectives touched down at Philadelphia International Airport. There, Ella Horner, filled with anticipation and anxiety, awaited the long-awaited arrival of her daughter. The reunion between mother and daughter was poised to unfold, marking the culmination of a distressing period of separation and uncertainty. Upon Sally's disembarkation from the aircraft, she eagerly rushed into her mother's embrace, and the two shared a poignant moment of hugging and tearful relief. The emotional reunion extended to include Sally's sister, brother-in-law, niece, and aunt, all of whom were present to witness and partake in the moving gathering. Subsequently, law enforcement swiftly intervened, escorting Sally to the Camden County Children's Shelter. There, she entered into protective custody, ensuring her safety during a brief but crucial period of adjustment. In parallel, La Salle, accompanied by two investigators, flew into Philadelphia the subsequent morning, making their return to Camden. Legal repercussions quickly followed, as La Salle faced charges of kidnapping and violating the Mann Act, specifically for transporting a minor across state lines for immoral purposes. Legal records from the Daily Record indicated that he entered a guilty plea, and in April 1950, County Judge Rocco Polizzi delivered a substantial sentence of 30, 35 years in prison. This marked a decisive legal response, signaling accountability for LaSalle's egregious actions and offering a measure of justice for Sally and her family. Following Sally's rescue, she made an effort to reintegrate into a semblance of normal life and resumed attending school. According to author Sarah Weinman, who extensively covered Sally's story in a 2018 book, the family actively discouraged conversations about her kidnapping, and she rarely shared details of her harrowing experience with anyone. Contrary to expectations, Sally's classmates, despite being aware of the trauma she had undergone, displayed a lack of empathy and subjected her to bullying, using derogatory and hurtful language. In the face of such adversity, Sally found solace and unwavering support in her friendship with Carol Taylor, leading to the formation of an inseparable bond between the two. Regrettably, the Horner family was not spared from further tragedy, as fate dealt another harsh blow. This unforeseen event added an additional layer of hardship to the already challenging journey of recovery for Sally and her family, perpetuating the cycle of adversity they had been enduring. On August 18, 1952, Sally, aged 15, tragically lost her life in a car accident that occurred in Woodbine, New York. The vehicle was driven by 20-year-old Edward Baker, who survived the crash. When Baker first met Sally, he believed she was 18 and was unaware of her abduction before her untimely death. However, as noted by Weinman, her passing left a lasting impact on him throughout the remainder of his life. In the aftermath of Sally's death, LaSalle, the man responsible for her abduction, sought release from state prison, contending that he was illegally convicted. Despite his efforts, the state Supreme Court rejected his appeal for a writ of habeas corpus. Subsequently, in July 1956, LaSalle pursued an application to have his sentence commuted, but this plea was also met with denial. He spent the remainder of his life behind bars and succumbed to arteriosclerotic heart disease at the age of 69 on March 22, 1969, 19 years after Sally's rescue. The sequence of events underscores the enduring impact of Sally's story on the lives of those involved, marking a poignant chapter in the aftermath of her tragic abduction. Lolita, penned by Russian author Vladimir Nabokov, made its debut in the United States in 1958. Although he never openly acknowledged it, Nabokov is believed to have drawn inspiration from Sally's abduction for his narrative. Within the pages of his book, Nabokov unfolds the tale of Humbert Humbert, a middle-aged man consumed by obsession and engaged in a sexual relationship with 12-year-old Dolores Dolly Hayes. Lolita emerged as Nabokov's most renowned and controversial work throughout his career. Despite being acknowledged as his most difficult book, it also provided him with the most pleasurable afterglow perhaps because it is the purest of all, the most abstract and carefully contrived, 
as revealed in a 1964 interview with Life magazine, as documented by Leland de la Durantaille in his 2007 book, Style is Matter, The Moral Art of Vladimir Nabokov. The book's intricate construction and abstract nature contributed to Nabokov's profound satisfaction, cementing its status as a significant and complex piece in his literary repertoire. The loss of Sally must have brought profound grief to both her mother and sister. It seems particularly unjust to have endured Sally's absence during the two-year ordeal, only to witness her tragic death two years later. Nevertheless, as people often say, life must continue. In 1965, Horner entered into marriage with Arthur Burkett. Unfortunately, Burkett passed away in 1970 at the age of 58. Horner, however, experienced a lengthy life and eventually passed away on May 27, 1998, at the age of 91. As for Sally's sister, Susan Panero, she passed away at the age of 85 on August 1, 2012. According to her obituary, Susan was a longtime resident of the Roebling, Florence area, and later in Browns Mills for 20 years before entering Marcella. She was primarily a homemaker, but in her earlier years she also worked at her in-law's business, Panaro's Greenhouses, in Florence. The accounts of their lives showcase the endurance of the Horner family in the face of tragic circumstances and the passage of time. Alvin Panaro, her husband, passed away on February 25, 2016, at the age of 91. In the aftermath of Sally's abduction in 1948, her niece Diana was born shortly thereafter. By the time Sally returned home, Diana was 19 months old. Tragically, Diana passed away on September 21, 2021, at the age of 73. Sally also had a nephew, Brian Panaro, whom she never had the opportunity to meet. Brian and his wife, Patty, currently reside in New Jersey. Unfortunately, their son, Anthony Brian Panero, passed away on December 22, 2020, at the age of 26. The family's journey is marked by both the losses they experienced and the passage of time.